Welcome to APA's weekly webinar. My name is Billy Zadik, Manager of Special Projects for APA. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. The webinar recording will be posted to APA's webpage later this afternoon. You receive a follow-up email in the next couple of days with a link to the webpage where all webinar recordings are housed, as well as a link to our upcoming webinars. We have webinars planned out through December 2021, and many are open for registration. Professional Continuing Education and AIA CLU credits are being offered for today's program. If you're an AIA professional requiring a certificate, please send an email to me at billie, B-I-L-L-I-E, at APA.org, along with your AIA membership number if you have not done so in the past. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Please type your questions in the chat box, and they will be answered in the order they are received. If we run out of time and we still have questions, Responses will be sent directly to the person asking the question by our presenter. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn this over to Kevin Scully. Kevin, take it away. Thank you, Billy. Uh, welcome today uh, to uh, the APA Lunch and Learn. Uh, and I just want to thank Billy uh, for her help in, trying, in, in getting this all set up and, and uh, helping us uh, get this organized. Uh, thank you very much. Today, uh, we're happy to be sharing information on the topic of creatively repositioning your real estate, building a case for repurposing and renovating on your campus. My name is Kevin Scully. I'm an architect and a partner at Design Collaborative Architects and Engineers in Fort Wayne, Indiana, with an office in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. I lead our higher education studio and have been practicing for about 34 years. Uh, I've been working in the education market for the majority of, of my career. And uh, the, one of the things that I really love about architecture is it allows me to, to uh, design, uh, but also love to build things. So I, I get to do both things in, in, my, uh, in my career. So uh, with that, let's just go ahead and, and jump into the presentation. Uh, college and universities are in an enrollment arms race. Uh, these are words you're probably tired of hearing by now, uh, words that are often used to, to support the arguments for adding space to the campus. Let me share with you a, a, uh, some information uh, to lay the groundwork for our presentation today. In the past 10 years or so, budgets have become incre increasingly tighter. Over the past 10 years, funding has been reduced uh, in most states by an average of 16% and some as much as 30%. Increasingly, it's difficult to obtain monies for capital expenditures. Enrollments are already or soon will be decreasing. You've already heard about the enrollment cliff. Well, it's here, it's, it's, it's upon us. By some reports, we will see a total of enrollment decrease uh, by nearly 10% by the year 2025. Pretty significant. For decades, we've been, we, we have known that our campuses have been aging. These aging buildings now represent about 40% of the space on our campuses. Nationally, we have a significant backlog of deferred maintenance. American School and University has documented that campuses average between $100 and $400 million worth of deferred maintenance nationwide. Many larger institutions report having over a billion dollars worth of, of deferred maintenance. We're not aware of any published total numbers, but in our estimation, this could be somewhere near a half a trillion dollars worth of deferred maintenance across all of our campuses. It really doesn't matter what the number is. <laughs> the point is that it's a very large number. Uh, and and uh, so while some campuses are addressing uh, some of the needs, uh, the numbers really aren't getting any smaller. We're really not, we're, we're not catching up and it's, it's probably gonna get worse and I'll share some information with you on that. Yet we know facilities play a significant role in attracting and retaining students. That's what this is all about. Because of this, we continue to add square footage to our campuses. By our calculation, we add about 4% of space to our campuses annually. We can certainly make sound arguments for, for how the campus of today, the students of today are different and their needs are different. How their space is, how new space is, is better than the, the original space that they had. Uh, it's more suited to meet the demands of students and faculty. I read a quote once, maybe it will resonate, resonate with you. Uh, Academics will fight over money, but kill over space. All these statistics and the anecdotes that I, that I share with you, except of course the killing uh, part, are, are true. Uh, uh, unfortunately, um, we are in, the, in a race here. These are all good reasons that are driving decisions to add space to our campuses. 
As you all know, space is a serious and expensive business in, 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 in the, on our college campuses. Let me share with you uh, some, some other numbers. In the past 50 years, our enrollment on all of our campuses has increased about 400% in the United States. In the 1960s, we were around 4.4 million uh, student in, in enrollment. Today, we're at 19.4 million. That sources the uh, National Center for Educational Statistics. But listen to this, in the same 50 years where we've increased uh, about uh, four times in enrollment, our campus space has grown exponentially from less than 700 million square feet totally to approximately 6 billion square feet of space on our campuses today. That's nearly twice the, the rate of, of enrollment growth. Look at this quote from 2017 State of the Facilities Higher Education Report. Many North American colleges and universities are pursuing a high risk strategy to build new campus facilities as a way to reverse lagging student enrollment. I'm sure you all experienced that and, and can see that happening on your campuses. As an office, we're experiencing a significant spike in renovation and repurposing. We see this, we see this spike every few years. It's usually in, in response to an economic downturn or something going on in the economy. However, this time we, we think uh, that this is going to, going to, due to economic pressures in, on higher education, this may be more of a long-term trend, maybe one that is necessary to help manage costs while remaining relevant in, in the industry. There are uh, five parts of the agenda that I'd like to go through today. Why, why, why would we propose uh, renovating, uh, repurposing and renovating buildings on our campuses? What is the value or what are the real numbers behind the story? What criteria should we use to help us evaluate whether a, a building is a good candidate for repurposing and renovating? Sustainability, what, do, what does and what should that just the word sustainability mean to me on, our, on my campus? And then finally, we'll share some uh, case studies that, with you that help uh, support some of the arguments we're gonna, we're gonna make today. So to dig in here, there are three components to, the, to answer the question of why we would make a case for, for uh, re re repurposing and, and renovating our, our space on campus. The first is uh, demands for space. The second is cost savings. And the third is sustainability. Let's dive into each just a little bit here. So the first one is, is demands for space. I think everybody probably understands this one, but, but, let, but let me be clear. There are so many changes in the educational environment today. Expectations of students and parents are much higher. The demands of attracting students to the campus applies pressure to almost every action we take on a campus. Pressure to create expanded educational opportunities, pressure to create additional athletic opportunities, facilities to meet the growing social and emotional needs of students, which is a big deal on campuses today. Uh, these pressures are, none of them are going away. They're things we're gonna to have to continue to deal with. So the first reason to explore repurposing and, and renovation is a demand for space. Uh, this, the second topic we're gonna to explain, I'll, I'll use here uh, an example that uh, we, we have. We did a few years ago a uh, significant uh, uh, study, assessment of, of a facility, about uh, uh, 320,000 square foot facility uh, for a client. At the end of the day, we, we found after the significant uh, uh, assessment that there was about $34 million worth of deferred maintenance in this facility. It's a pretty significant number and the, and the client turned to us and asked, so what would it cost to replace this facility? Our assessment was uh, that particular facility would be about $59 million worth, worth to replace. This, may, this comparison is one that we had really never done and, and never, certainly not to the extent that we had done uh, with, with this one. Um, but we started, it started to really make us think about the uh, significant savings, 30 to 40% uh, that could be saved by repurposing that facility that actually had good bones to it, a good structure. Uh, obviously all the systems and stuff in, in the building uh, really need to be replaced, but, but the building itself was, was good and, and placed at the right location on campus. So we really, uh, again, it just really made us start thinking about uh, building a case for repurposing uh, and renovating facilities. There's 
as as we dive into the costs here, there's there's really uh, or dive into the uh, you know, the savings. There's really three components to the savings uh, that in the example we just shared: the initial cost in the, in the savings, the schedule implication, or there's some savings on the schedule, and then something I'm going to call fiscal plant size creep. And I'll explain that here in, in, in a moment. So let's let's dig into the initial cost uh, piece. As we look at the components of the building, this, this information is actually from RS Mains, uh, widely distributed and utilized uh, uh, trade uh, journal uh, that documents da uh, data uh, on construction costs uh, across the country and then distributes it in a, in a large catalog. This is a uh, catalog of information that we use quite readily um, and is very reliable. The, the, if we look at the, the components of a building that we think uh, are impacted by uh, renovation versus uh, new construction, the first one is the building pad. In a, in when we renovate or repurpose a, a building, we don't have to build an, uh, a, a, building, a new building pad that's already there, obviously. Uh, the, the equivalent savings of that through this, uh, this uh, catalog of RS means is somewhere between three and 4% from the cost of building new construction. The foundations, likewise, are, are an existing part of the building, and presuming they're in good shape, uh, we'll, we'll talk about evaluation in a, in a moment, uh, but the foundations, assuming they're in good shape, should uh, yield us a savings of four to five percent savings, uh, depending on the complexity of the building and so forth, uh, the value of new construction compared to renovation, we should save four to five percent of, of the total uh, cost of, of building new. Uh, the structural frame, uh, similar to the foundations, uh, assuming it's in good shape and we do an evaluation, uh, th there's the value of that in, in new construction is somewhere between seven and eight percent. Exterior walls, a little more uh, variation here, uh, mainly because there's different components, materials, uh, there may be some portions of the exterior wall that we need to replace, windows would be a good example of that. Uh, but even with all that, given all that, uh, there's still a savings of somewhere between 11 and 17 uh, percent uh, over new construction uh, by by repurposing this building. And the final component uh, is, is of the physical construction is, is roof, and and that's uh, similar again based on the complexity of the roof and, and materials used and so forth. Somewhere between three and five percent of the value of, of new construction could be saved uh, by reusing that existing roof. The last component I'll touch on here briefly and then talk a little bit more on the next slide is uh, reduced construction time. Uh, uh, construction equals, uh, I'm sorry, time equals with dollars. And, and so when we look at uh, construction, reducing construction time, we're, we're talking about general conditions, uh, uh, superintendent time on the site, contractor fee, all kinds of things that, uh, the, that uh, we save uh, uh, really general conditions money on, the con on construction. The value of that's somewhere between uh, two and three percent. So you can see the the total of those on the low end is is thirty percent, and on the high end, 40, 42 uh, percent. That we believe we could, there's potential savings for when we look at uh, uh, repurposing this this facility. Let me use an example here uh, of a build a project we're working on right, right now. It's under construction um, and. Uh, the client asked us to renovate 35,000 square feet uh, in an existing facility. Um, we uh, ended up determining that the construction time for that, and we're about halfway through construction, will be complete in, in August of this year. Um, we determined the construction schedule to be about seven months of this. It was an aggressive schedule. We were trying to fit it in between semesters and be complete for the fall. So uh, it, at the end of seven months, we'll be complete with 35,000 square feet of construction. A new building, uh, by contrast, would have taken somewhere around 12 months to build. So there's a, a savings of about five months of general conditions, again, superintendent time, project manager time, uh, gen, uh, general contractor fee, et cetera, uh, that uh, realizes uh, real savings uh, on, on the, on the um, cost of new construction. So the last, last uh, third component uh, of cost savings that I, I want to talk about is, is uh, space creep on the campus. Kind of an odd word, uh, sorry to use that, uh, that word, but uh, we're, really what we're talking about here are when, when a decision is, is made to build a, a new building on campus, 
we've often found that it's it's hard to make that decision to take down that older structure. So we built a new building to replace the existing. We've added 100,000 square feet to the campus. Uh, the existing building might have been smaller, maybe it's 80,000 square feet of space on, on the campus. Um, and it remains in a, maybe a mothballed state if, if, we're, if we're lucky, we're not having to maintain that facility. Maybe five years down the road or so, and this is something we've seen on, on many campuses, uh, maybe five years down the road or so, an academic dean or, or somebody gets a bright idea and says, boy, I could really just use about 10,000 square feet of that building over there. It'll be fine, it'll be perfect for us. We just need to, we got the startup program, we need to move in here um, and, and we'll just, uh, you know, just take 10,000 square feet of that, uh, that building over in the corner over there. And before you know it, uh, that 10,000 square feet creeps into 20,000 or maybe 30,000. We've seen some situations where, you know, the, the building ends up being completely used. Uh, in fact, one that comes to mind, uh, an art department uh, wanted to use uh, an existing facility. It was an old elementary school on the edge campus the university had purchased and, and uh, they moved in just with intent of using two or three uh, classrooms, uh, fitted them out for some lab spaces for students. They were crammed in their existing building and really needed some space. The university allowed them to move in. Before they knew it, they were renovating space in there. Um, and, and now they've actually occupied the entire building, 53,000 square feet, if my memory serves me right. Um, and so we see this happen time after time on campuses. Uh, and so unintentionally, our, our, our campus inventory of space increases. Uh, really without a, a strategic plan in place. That wasn't planned to happen. It just kind of happens uh, and uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's, it's where the cost of, of, of these decisions really start to impact us. So the next uh, topic on our, on our agenda was, um, uh, the first topic was, was repurposing. Uh, and the value of that, the, th the third topic we uh, talk about on our agenda is sustainability. And unfortunately, the term sustainability has, has become a politically charged word these days. And, and the way we want it would refer to that this term is, is uh, really uh, long-term value uh, or the true definition, which is the ability to be maintained at a certain rate or level. It's kind of the world uh, you, you all live in. Uh, it's so critical for, for us to make sure that uh, we take intentional steps uh, to, to repurpose and, and renovate our, our buildings uh, and to make sure they meet your expectations as a physical plant. Ultimately, you have to maintain these buildings and operate these facilities. And so when we, when we take these steps to repurpose a building, we really need to make sure that, that we're doing it the right way and, and putting up in place a, a facility that you can support and maintain. Uh, a good fair evaluation will obviously would help with this. There's also uh, the component that I really haven't talked about. I didn't talk about it in the in the cost side of things or anything, and that's the uh, the the waste side. If we actually just if if it is determined that we want to remove this building from campus, um, raise the building, we're generating a tremendous amount of of waste, and obviously that's going to a landfill somewhere, which has its own sustainability issues as we as we talk about sustainability. I'd like to touch on one more thing with regard to sustainability. That's this chart that uh, I've pulled from, uh, from Gordian, uh, a database on uh, the history of, of construction. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with this, but let me kind of walk you through this. The bottom in blue represents the volume, volume of, of new construction taking place on, on campuses. You can see a, a huge peak right around 1970 uh, that, that uh, we can see there on, on the chart in ex exceeding 10%. Um, the second peak happens around 2008, 2007, 2008, somewhere, somewhere in there. But the, if we start at the, at the 2000, or, I'm sorry, the 1970 peak and project out the, the, the life cycle of particular systems in the building, the plumbing at 35 years in blue, that, that bar chart that runs across the top of the, the volume of construction, in red, the exterior uh, shell of the building and the, and the HVAC systems at 30 years, the roofing and the electrical systems at 25 years, each of those bars, and at the, at, you see that vertical dash that uh, Gordian has put on the, on the uh, bar for us, that's when the, we've hit the, uh, the end of the life cycle of those facilities and they should be really considered for, for re, uh, uh, replacement. 
Well, notice that where those, that first wave cycle from the 1970s falls right about the same time that we're starting, or maybe uh, they end right about the same time that we're starting the next wave cycle of new facilities in 2000, 2007, 2008. Uh, so we begin that second wave uh, of life cycles, and look what happens if we go out in that uh, 25, 30, 35 year lifespan. It overlaps uh, almost perfectly with the second life cycle from the from the 1970s uh, surge that we saw in construction. So, and that's all happening uh, right about the same time where we're starting to ex really start to experience the dip in, in enrollment. Twenty, that's in 25. Uh, this this peak of of replacement of systems is happening looks like somewhere between 35 and 45, 2035 and 2045. Uh, so it has an overlap uh, overlapping effect that uh, that they really point out here. And I I just like this chart just because it helps us helps remind us of, of the importance of making sure we're doing our part to to provide facilities that are sustainable and and long lasting. Uh, even know, knowing that uh, at some point uh, those systems need to be replaced and, and unfortunately those cycles in this case are are lining up uh, unfortunately uh, perfectly. I guess if there is some, a, a, a bright side to this, many of you will probably be retired by the time that second life cycle comes around. Uh, I know I will be. So the, the fourth topic on our agenda is evaluation criteria. Let's, let's dig into this one a little bit. There's four components to this that we'd like to touch on. So code compliance be the first one, the program or space needs fit is, is the second one. Site considerations would be the third and then project requirements the fourth. So code compliance is, is obviously important. If we're gonna get serious about looking at repurposing or renovating a building, obviously codes have changed in, in that cycle of 30, 40, 50 years, and we really need to take a serious look at, at the original building and make sure that it is still compliant with, with code. Uh, we want to make sure that we're not putting any of our students at risk in a, in a building. And, and so it's important to look at that. Uh, uh, sprinkler systems have become um, much more pr uh, preeminent in, in, the, in the industry. Uh, we see a lot more of them today than we did back 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, that's allowed us to do a lot, uh, build a lot, a lot larger buildings uh, than what we were able to build uh, many years ago. Often we see these uh, repurposed buildings be a building on the edge of campus that may have not been an academic building at one point. It may, it may have been uh, a grocery store or, or a retail center or, or an old elementary school. Um, you know, the, the, code, the code considerations, uh, when we look at those buildings, uh, are begin to, gonna be significantly different. So uh, a retail building is built uh, significantly different than a, an academic building. So we really need to make sure we're, we're looking at all the code considerations and, and, give, and giving that a, a fair and honest uh, evaluation. Uh, programming is the second one, and this should be pretty self-explanatory. We would have to do this for uh, new construction as well, uh, but we really are doing test fits. We wanna make sure that the building that we're looking at repurposing and moving this new program into uh, is, is suitable and, and sized appropriately to, to handle the new program going into it. Um, this, we also wanna think about uh, growth uh, and, and hopefully uh, build, building some growth in, into that uh, new facility. Uh, so we really wanna take an honest look at that and make sure it's gonna fit we really should do some test fits to make sure it's going to lay out properly. Uh, one thing with uh, you know an old uh, retail um, building is going to have a certain shape that may may not work ideally for for an ac academic building. Um, certainly, a grocery store. We've we got an example of that we'll share with you has its own considerations. That's usually a larger box, and so we're going to end up with labs or classrooms in the center of a box without natural lighting. So. All kinds of things come into play there when we start looking at uh, that programming component. So really should look at some test fits and, and make sure that we're comfortable with the way that's gonna lay out. The third component of our evaluation criteria is site considerations. Uh, and, and this one's really driven by a couple different things. Uh, uh, the primary one that, that, I, that we like to think of is uh, where is this building located? As I mentioned, many of these facilities often end up being at the perimeter or edge of campus. It's, it's a building that we, uh, a campus has acquired over the years uh, and again, it may have had a, a maybe had a retail use or, or whatever it may have been. Uh, we want to think about the travel distance. Uh, uh, we want to make sure the students can travel. If this is going to be used for academic space, so the students can travel back and forth to this 
building uh, and, and in, be in the class period ch uh, changeover um, and in an inappropriate time. The second component is uh, a lot of times campuses like to have that physical connection. Uh, they really don't want the students crossing over or through uh, a bunch of busy streets or uh, through uh, private residences or, or other types of things. So um, it's not a, a, uh, a make or break type decision, but it's something that we really want would like to consider uh, as we think about uh, how we tra students travel back and forth to this uh, potentially repurposed facility. The last one is, is project requirements, and, and that's that dealing into or uh, getting into um, the volume uh, of, a, of a building. So some, if we're gonna move engineering labs, uh, a lot of times engineering labs uh, want more ceiling height or volume within the space. There are other academic spaces that need that kind of volume, uh, lecture halls and so forth. Um, uh, other, other components uh, to that may be just um, loading on the floors. Uh, there may be, if we're moving a library uh, in, that might be an extreme case, but in case, in case we are, there may be different loading criteria on the floor that we really have to, really have to consider. So we really want to make sure we're taking all those things into account and, and doing our due diligence to evaluate the appropriateness of, of this new, uh, of this repurposed building and make sure it will fit and, and uh, solve the needs of, of, our new, uh, of our new proposed facility. Uh, the final thing I'd like to touch on our agenda is, is some case studies, uh, and I've got five of them here that I'd like to share with you, all uh, uh, quite different uh, in, in um, the way we've approached these. The first one is uh, St. Mary's College, um, and at, th at this facility, uh, uh, St. Mary's College is uh, built um, on a campus that was originally uh, occupied by the Sisters of Holy Cross. Many of the buildings uh, were used by the sisters originally, and as their numbers have shrunk, the buildings are being taken over uh, by the uh, by the university or by the college. Many of uh, many of the buildings are, are new on campus, um, but they are also uh, occupying older facilities. This one in particular uh, is an old novitiate uh, that was used to house uh, the sisters. Uh, the, the, there were two towers that were housing. Those were pretty actually pretty easy to move into and allow students to, to occupy those rooms as, as student rooms. The center part of the building, the, the first floor and, and the, ground, uh, the basement level, um, were being used just, they had just moved uh, some academic departments in here. Uh, not real intentional about who was going in there and how it was being used, um, uh, but it, it, they had started to occupy the facility. Um, their goal when they presented it to us was to relocate the, their growing kind of flagship uh, uh, health sciences department, nursing department uh, in here. Um, obviously, uh, nursing, uh, the way we're teaching nursing today is very different. Uh, a lot of hands-on labs, uh, simulation, so forth. Um, we're also trying to mimic the healthcare environment that these students will ultimately end up in and, and working in, in in their careers. And so uh, some, some things that are very important. The picture on the left is, is a before picture. When we walk in the front doors, that's kind of what we saw. Um, that, that, that those doors there, a uh, beautiful set of doors lead into a, a really nice chapel uh, on the inside that sat about uh, 300, uh, 300 people inside that chapel. Uh, the rendering on the right shows pieces of that, that chapel, uh, just a part of it. Uh, but the important part to point highlight right now is, is the clear story light that wraps around the top of, of that chapel space. It's, you see the stained glass around there, allowing that natural light to come into that chapel space. Uh, one of the things we really wanted to do uh, is, is to find a better way to use the, the basement of this facility. It was actually a nice basement. Uh, it was dry, had nice ceiling heights. Um, the the uh, mechanical systems in the building had been replaced already and, and were in really good, sh good shape. Um, but when we talked to faculty about using that, that basement space down there, uh, of course, they, there was resistance. I mean, who wants to move into a dark, uh, dingy basement? And it, and it was dingy. Uh, it, it looked like catacombs, uh, corridors that led to nowhere, long, narrow corridors that, le that led to nowhere. It was being used primarily for, for storage space down there. So when we looked at the facility after uh, a lot of test fits and really trying to figure out how we were going to fit everything in here, uh, we finally arrived at the, uh, the idea of punching 
holes in that wall where the, the doors are in that picture on the left, um, and then creating an atrium space by punching a, a hole in the floor and allowing that natural light from the clear story from the original chapel to start to filter into the, the, the core of this building uh, in a more intentional way, and more importantly, down into that basement and give it a lot more natural light, creating this, this hub down there for students uh, to hang out, uh, study, some create some study spaces in this, this uh, uh, central hub space down below. Uh, then in, in that lower level, we were able to actually put uh, all the simulation labs, uh, kind of like in the spokes of a wheel. We kind of uh, went down the corridors uh, with, with the simulation labs. Um, so that we didn't get too far from this 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 hub uh, that we created here. You also notice we integrated some uh, some uh, a green wall in this case. That's kind of a, a trend in healthcare, uh, not just healthcare education, but in healthcare today. Uh, biophilia walls, trying to get them to be represent a, a healthy environment, and uh, uh, so we're again trying to mimic that healthcare environment uh, for these students as they uh, as they get educated for their and prepared for their uh, education and, and ultimate career in this facility. Here's some renderings of, of some student spaces, hangout spaces, also um, uh, the simulation labs that will be in here that, again, mimic the various components of, a, of either a hospital or an outpatient center or clinic or whatever that might be. And uh, all of those actually occur in this facility. We're excited to see this. Uh, uh, come to completion. This, this is one I mentioned earlier. It, it will complete uh, uh, in August, uh, actually the end of July, for for the uh, the college to move into it and get ready for students coming in the fall. The second one that I'd like to use as, as a case study is the University of Notre Dame uh, Newland Hall. In the early 2000s, uh, University of Notre Dame opened uh, the Jor Gor Jordan Hall of Science. Uh, it's a beautiful new facility uh, with uh, modern uh, uh, lab experiences for students um, throughout the facility, classrooms and so forth. They um, uh, abandoned Newland Hall or portions of, of a good portion of Newland Hall when they moved into Jordan Hall of Science. And it had been empty for five or six years. And, and they came to us and, and said, we really need to start thinking about uh, moving uh, folks back into this facility. But, um, you know, we're having difficulty convincing faculty that they should move out of uh, the Jordan Hall of Science, brand new facility, beautiful facility, into the older facility that we abandoned. You can see the picture on the left here, the kind of dark dreary corridors uh, lined with uh, utilities for uh, supporting the, the labs that were once in there. Um, and let me just share with you uh, another picture here, the floor plans that explain this just a little bit better maybe. So you can see on the picture on the left before uh, that, that quadrant on the left, this is one particular floor of the building, we just picked a floor here. Uh, that quadrant on the upper left there is, was where labs were uh, lined down through the corridor. You notice the wall at the corridor is, is very uh, deep, uh, very thick. That's where all the utilities ran vertically up and down the building to feed all the, all the lab spaces. Uh, by the labs being out of the, uh, out of the building, uh, moved to the new facility, we were able to open that wall up and, and really uh, start to gain a little bit of of natural light, brings that natural light into the core of, of the building. We also use uh, creative use of glass along the corridors to allow that even where we wanted uh, in, in closed spaces, conference rooms or offices, allow that natural light to spill into the core of the building and also create these, these nice hubs for students, student hangout, study and so forth. Um, the university uh, facilities folks were very pleased that we were able to attract uh, faculty and students back into this space. So you can tell it's got a nice fresh, modern look to it, and, and the, the, uh, the way we brought natural light in was the kind of the difference maker there um, to everybody. The next case study, uh, our third one here is uh, Indiana Wesleyan University. Uh, they were getting ready to start up an engineering program, uh, and we had uh, looked at different facilities uh, to house this in over the years. Uh, the idea of this uh, program starting up uh, uh, started back in, in 2015. Um, and we finally settled on uh, this uh, old grocery store that was about a four minute walk from the center campus. Uh, we had done several test fits in it to make sure that it would work and, and fit. We could get everything to fit in there and allow for future growth. Uh, obviously the distance from campus was reasonable. Um, and as the campus continued to, to grow in this direction while there, we were uh, sending students um, uh, down a street. It wasn't a busy street. 
uh, and across uh, at, at this point just one private property. It was a restaurant, so it wasn't horrible. We were able to bring them down a uh, sidewalk and, and cross over the the street uh, to act, gain access to this facility. This is currently in, in planning design right now. Um, uh, again, the picture on the bottom shows the, the grocery store as it existed, uh, uh, well, as it, as it exists today. Um, our, in working with the construction manager, we determined that that uh, bump out on the front there, where like, you see all the sloped glass, um, has significant issues. That uh, The uh, walls are, are allowing moisture to penetrate. Uh, the roofs are, are in bad shape. Um, uh, this was an addition that was put on the original building. We've determined with the construction manager that it's going to be most cost effective just to rip that, uh, that piece of the building off and, and um, uh, start over. Uh, the space, we were having a hard time with the angled walls and stuff, find, trying to find a good way to, to use the, the space that was in there in a, an efficient way. Um, and so the, the rendering on the top shows how we've stripped off that uh, addition, that odd-shaped addition. Um, we've actually recessed the entry to keep it simple here. Um, we've introduced a little bit of the brick from the, the main heart of campus here. Um, and then uh, we've taken the exterior walls of the building, which were um, non-insulated, uh, a building probably built in the, in the 70s originally. We don't have any documentation on it. Um, but uh, non-insulated built exterior walls, uh, are, our plan is to insulate those walls on the exterior, cover it with that metal siding and, and end up with a much more sustainable uh, building when, when we're all said and done. So we evaluated code, we evaluated the space fit, we evaluated its, its site location, and, and of course the project requirements, and, and uh, made the determination that this was the, the right place to go. Um, we anticipate that this is gonna be built for about two thirds of the cost of, of, of new building. We've got some significant work to do on the inside, and, um, but it'll be a beautiful, beautiful facility uh, when we're all done. The next case study is uh, University of St. Francis. Um, picture on the left is the building uh, as it stood in the, in the early 90s. Um, and uh, it was an abandoned building. It was an old oil refinery building, uh, repackaging oil, putting on, um, on rail cars and, and sending it off. So it's located on a rail spur. Uh, this site uh, and, and building is, is located about a five minute walk from the core of campus. Uh, in this one, we're really just sending kids through the through the athletic campus, through baseball and softball fields, uh, to get to the, to this facility. So, um, location was actually good. Uh, this was really the first building that they had uh, gone remote on. Uh, we often actually find that uh, art buildings are a good candidate for a remote campus students, uh, and similar to engineering, students end up going to the facility uh, maybe early in the morning or mid-morning and it ended up staying there uh, most of the day using that facility. And so uh, that remote campus is actually a, a pretty good candidate for, for an art building. Uh, this, the other thing that made this building in particular a good candidate for, for a renovation to an art building was the fact that we could leave some of the interior walls exposed brick and so forth that really kind of uh, fed into that whole studio creative environment and uh, this, the the art program as we moved it in here is, is grown exponentially. It's, of course, they've gained a lot of space in here, um, but this building, it really just supports the, uh, that really creative environment. And they found this building to be a, a tremendous asset to, their, to the campus. The last example that I'll use here is the Heine Pharmacy at, at Purdue University. Um, this was uh, a, uh, just a really just a renovation in, in the existing uh, uh, pharmacy building. It used to be uh, the library of the pharmacy, and um, in and uh, you could see this really kind of dimly lit, uh, somewhat dreary facility that um, uh, was not attractive to students at all, um, and it wasn't really the type of facility that supported the activity uh, that they were really looking to support. Um, and so through some discussions, uh, we ended up uh, creating several uh, group study spaces on the upper and lower levels. We enclosed them with glass that allowed for that, that connection, that visual connection, that uh, see and be seen that uh, students often like to, to have on the campus, uh, have that visual connection to other students. Um, and then created uh, you know, uh, some open uh, seating space out here as well that can be used uh, in a variety of ways, actually, it could be used for some seminar space or, or other purposes as well. 
uh, freshened up the lighting, the ceilings, uh, the paint, uh, introduced some, uh, some, a new stair in here that was uh, a little more modern feeling and really gave this uh, building a, a, a face, the space, a, a good facelift. Um, unfortunately, this picture was taken during the early part of the pandemic. Uh, we understand the facility is, is uh, uh, getting, getting great use uh, today. Um, and students are enjoying the space and, and really using those group study spaces uh, the way we uh, typically see them used. Uh, it's one of the most demanded spaces on a college campus today is, are those group study spaces. Uh, we're seeing those go in uh, a variety of buildings. So with that, uh, I, I'd like to summarize with uh, just a, a few words here. Uh, with an aging infrastructure and, and millions of square feet of, of building built in the 1950s and 60s on our campuses across the country, we, th we, we must face the reality that we cannot continue to replace all of these buildings with new structures. There are going to be arguments made for, for new facilities. And, and like we said, we need to be fair and, and, and when we do our evaluation of these facilities and make sure that we're being honest with ourselves. Some just aren't going to work. They aren't going to fit. Um, but we should do our part to, to weigh the options of repurposing these uh, older facilities. They're often really well-built facilities uh, with roughly 25 million square feet uh, of new construction put in place each year on campuses across the United States. We just don't believe that this is a sustainable model, especially as uh, enrollments start to, to start to decline, which obviously is going to impact uh, 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 revenue. So what can, what can we all do? Uh, we need we need to get serious about re repurposing and renovating our, our existing building inventory, reshaping it to serve the, the needs of the educational environment today. We need to get creative with the way we're solving some of these some of these uh, uh, space needs problems. We need to be more intentional about evaluating uh, our our inventory on a regular basis and completing in depth fair assessments uh, on these structures. Let's, we try to, let's try to be honest with, with ourselves and, and re, re uh, as we try to accomplish these reimagined spaces. Again, uh, sometimes we just need to be creative. It's always, uh, it is easier to design a, a new facility than, than renovate an old, but uh, sometimes there's a, a great challenge that, that we love to accept and when we're repurposing and renovating that, that older facility. We don't think this, uh, this approach alone, uh, repurposing and renovating buildings is gonna uh, solve all the problems that we have on college campuses. Of course it can't, um, but we know facilities are an expensive part of, our, of, our, uh, of, of a cost of, of running a, of a campus. And so we think this is, this is gonna be part of a solution to help, uh, help us sustain uh, uh, the existence of our of a higher education as we move forward and, and try and find ways to make it more economical and affordable uh, for students overall. So with that, uh, I'd like to open up to questions. Billy, I think you're going to field questions for us. Uh, hopefully we've got I, a few. I sure am, Kevin, and we do have questions coming in. Our first Great. question is, can a glazed clay tile block wall be updated? <laughs> Yeah, that's always that's always a good question. And actually, there are some paints out there uh, that can cover uh, cover that. That's the inexpensive solution um, to uh, just change the the color of that wall. Of course, we can cover it as well. Uh, but you know, one of the great parts about that glazed tile is very durable, um, and that's why it was put in there originally. And so, um, uh, we do have a campus where we've actually were able to find a paint uh, to change the the color of it. I think in that one it was actually pink. Believe it or not, really pale pink. Um, and so we had to we had to find a way to address that. Um, uh, so that is one way to do it. And, and as I mentioned, uh, another way would be to uh, to just cover it with uh, other durable materials. Um, and uh, um, there's uh, plenty of options there as well. But they're they're more expensive than the paint. Okay, thank you. Our next question is about swing space. We need space in other buildings built before we can re model something already in use yeah. at my yeah. campus it is still considered additional addition of new space how do we address this you know i, I think uh hopefully this is going to answer your question but the one that comes to mind actually is um is that notre dame project actually they were using that i believe as swing space uh for for a while uh, they weren't doing a lot of work to that, but as they were building other facilities on campus, they needed space to put uh, folks into on a temporary basis. And, and some of these older facilities 
allowed them to, to do that. Um, uh, I, I mentioned uh, another one where we had an elementary school that was really uh, kind of in the heart of campus uh, to some extent. That actually became for a while swing space for traditional uh, classrooms as, as they were run out of space before we built new academic buildings. So um, some of these older buildings actually without doing a lot of renovation uh, can become, you know, if there's a long term plan for the building to for it to become something else in, in the interim, it could be used, it can be used for uh, uh, swing space while we uh, repurpose or renovate or build new. Okay, thank you. Next question. Should campuses assess all of their buildings regularly or should it be done on an as needed or case by case basis? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I would suggest that everybody should uh, do an assessment on their on their buildings on a fairly regular basis. Um, five uh, years, maybe 10 years, it really depends on how you uh, I mean, tie it in with your budgeting cycles and, and how much funding uh, you're able to get to, to help maintain these facilities. Um, but things change, as, as you know, in our facilities on a fairly uh, quick basis. So um, I think 10 years is, is a good pace. Uh, we do have a, a campus that, that does it every three years. They do it as part of a, a budgeting cycle for their uh, re, uh, renovation, uh, uh, renovating of, of buildings and, and use that to support their, their uh, request for budgets uh, for, for those renovations. Um, so I would re highly recommend that you're doing uh, assessments on a, on a regular basis and not necessarily on a, on a as needed basis. I would also add to that a uh, 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 second um, way to answer that, and that is there are different levels of assessment. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier the assessment we, we did for that large facility, a 340, 320,000 square foot facility. That was a really, really in-depth uh, assessment. I mean, we we're really looking uh, at, at components and, and operating components, making sure that we understood how they operated and, and, and uh, uh, if, if there was an issue with the way they were operating, um, really digging in above ceilings. Um, some of the assessments that you do in, on a regular basis, uh, if it's a five-year cycle or a 10-year cycle or a three-year cycle, like the, the one campus I mentioned, um, could be a more of a visual and a light touch uh, assessment. It's something that you may be able, you may have the staff to do. Uh, certainly, um, there are professionals that, that do that stuff as well. Um, but you don't always have to spend a lot of dollars to, to produce um, uh, a light assessment that would give you uh, a, a pretty good indicator of life cycle left on roof, uh, mechanical components, electrical components, et cetera. So um, a couple of answers, a couple of different ways to answer that there. Hopefully, I've, I've given you some, uh, some, some tools to use. Okay, our next question. The cost of ACM, lead, and PCB removal can be immense. Would this be one of the first steps to form a study before exploring renovating campus buildings? Um, I think I would say it depends on how extensive it is. Uh, um, I, I, I guess ultimately uh, that it's gonna have to be removed anyway, so, so maybe it's a good step to go ahead and remove it first, but you also might want to look at the facility and, and just do an assessment to determine, you know, what the future of this facility could be before you get into the actual cost of, of removal of, of all that. So um, uh, I, I think I would suggest do a, a study of the building, look and, and determine if there is a, a long term use for that facility and then might be uh, allow you to put in place a plan to, to um, uh, then take steps to uh, uh, remove some of, some of those uh, materials from the building. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Our next question. What are the pros, cons, or financial implications for renovations in terms of phased renovation versus renovated while occupied versus relocation during renovation? Yeah, great question. Um, and uh, the answer is it's always less expensive to do it in un unoccupied. And so the key to that is finding swing space. Um, that uh, uh, St. Mary's College project that I mentioned to you in our case studies, um, we were actually able to relocate uh, the folks in that building uh, into some swing space on, on campus on an interim basis that allowed us to re reduce the, the time frame for construction um, and the cost uh, for, for both. Uh, and so 
uh, a big implication if we can do that. Um, sometimes we can't, and we've got to look at a, at a phased renovation, and that will add, add, add dollars to, to the renovating costs. Um, uh, we're doing that with a, a, a large high school right now that will be, remain occupied while we do the, the renovation work. Obviously, we can do some stuff over the summer uh, like we can on a college campus, but, uh, um, but uh, looking for swing space in the building. Sometimes temporary classrooms uh, need to be used to, to move folks out to create a little more swing space. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, the ideal situation would be to, uh, to move them out completely and, and uh, minimize uh, all the cost impact. Sometimes that's just not achievable. Okay, thank you. Yeah. What is the best way to prioritize competing needs? Deferred maintenance, new space, renovations, et cetera. Wow, uh, that's, a, that's a loaded question. Um, uh, I think I would suggest that it's kind of a balanced approach. I, I don't, unfortunately, uh, um, I don't think we can tackle all deferred maintenance and, and let all of our other needs go on campus. Uh, uh, while that would be great, I just don't think that's uh, the uh, way that we're gonna be able to do this. Um, and so we kind of need to find a way to, to balance uh, many of these components as we, as we move through these. Uh, we're gonna have to build some new space. We're gonna have to renovate some old space at the, at the same time. So uh, a, a really intentional plan. Again, I can't emphasize enough the assessment piece uh, the planning pieces to make sure we've got a plan in place and understand how all those overlap with each other as we move through our strategic plan of the university, which should put in place for us the, uh, the important pieces that we need to tackle uh, uh, first with the highest priority. Okay, thank you. We have one more question here. Okay, Is great. it recommended that, that campuses maintain a real-time account of their utilization campus-wide? Mm -hmm. What is the best way to do so? Yeah, that's a, another great question. There are, uh, there are databases out there um, that are used. In fact, uh, NCES, I believe, actually has um, a guideline for how to categorize your space on campus, uh, what's considered office. Some of it's really simple, but what's considered lab. And there's, but there's a lot of, like, what do you consider uh, a space? a student um, a group study space. How is that categorized on campus? So uh, there are great guidelines for that out there. Uh, we highly recommend that, that, that uh, you know what spaces you have on campus. Uh, there's really, uh, if you can categorize it and have all your space documented, it provides you a much better uh, a platform to, to work from in terms of, of uh, arguing against adding new space to campus because uh, we can then use that database to, to measure against peer institutions. Uh, if we know we've got way more square footage on campus than, than our peer institutions, we've got to find a, a way to look, uh, look at uh, using that space more efficiently. And we really don't know what the answer to that is unless we, we have uh, categorized and, and documented all the space we have on campus. So, um, yeah, talking about the, the competing priorities, uh, uh, a couple of questions ago, that that's one that I would put high on the list. It, it, it's not costly, it's time consuming. Um, if you have uh, students on campus during summer, it might be a great way uh, for them if you get a data, uh, that database set up and they're just kind of going around buildings and documenting uh, space, uh, space and how it's being used on campus. Um, anyway, I think that's a, 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 that should be a high priority. Again, it, it gives you a, a platform to really argue uh, against or for uh, renovating, repurposing, building new, whatever, whatever the case may be. Uh, but if you don't have that, that information, uh, you really uh, don't have a, a way to um, uh, build a case against or for. All right. Well, that looks like we've come to the end of our questions that we have for you. Uh, Kevin, do you have a, would you be so kind as to give everyone your contact information? I, I would. I, I probably should have thought of that ahead of time and, and uh, put it on the screen. But my contact information is, uh, my email address is kscully, S-C-U-L-L-Y, at designcollaborative.com. And uh, I'd be happy so to answer any questions that you have uh, by email. Thank you. Yes, yeah, well... Usually what happens is people think of questions after 
the end of the session. So, Kevin, thank you so much for a well, wonderful, well-organized presentation today. And to our attendees, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. So until next time, be safe, stay healthy, and have a great week. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank you all.